Hello, and welcome to Book Break for Greece Public Library. I'm Kirster. I'm one of the librarians here. I moderate our Pints and Prose book discussion group. And I am joined, as always, by my favorite reader, Claire. Hi, everyone. I'm Claire, and I do the historical Facebook group and also as the page turns. I feel like I'm out of practice. It's been a while. It's been a while. Yeah. Um, and this is actually going to be our final book break for 2021. So check. That's yeah. right. Check. Done. That's and it's our featuring our best of 2021. Yes. Some best. of Kirsters yeah. and my mm -hmm. favorite picks that were actually published this year. Exactly. So. so before we dive into the books that we picked for our best of, um, I wanted to just do a little kind of reading year in review. Um, maybe we can talk about, so um, what was your reading year like for 2021? Claire? My reading year was, I read a lot this year, yeah. more so than I've read probably the last couple of years. Um, I think I was a little bit over 80, 80 something. And uh, I read more mysteries and thrillers this mm -hmm. year. Normally, I'm very much a historical reader, which, of course, I read a lot of those, too. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely skewed more to the mystery. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that says about me. But <laughs> um, I kind of feel like it says that 2021 was a year where we still needed some escapism. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, I also read more than I did last year. Not quite as much as you did. Someday I'll get there, Claire. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had quite a few thrillers and a few really good thrillers. Yeah. Um, and then I feel like I noticed some themes and it's hard to say whether they're themes in like all books that seems presumptuous, but certainly the books that I was like aware of and reading. So I, I had like two kind of notable themes that I noticed in the books that I was reading. So um, there were kind of meta books about like questions of authorship and who gets to tell certain stories mm -hmm. um, and that kind of thing. And then I also had a bunch of books that were about like grief and trauma. Yeah. Um, I definitely had some grief and trauma and some of them, it, I think it's what sucked me in, mm -hmm. you know, um, some very relevant and timely themes that parallel in today. Mm -hmm. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And when you think about the fact that like the books that were published now were probably, well, certainly finalized and if not drafted in like, 2020 right. <laughs> that starts to make a little more sense I think right yeah. at least the grief trauma part yeah and I've noticed that in some of the ones released at the end of this year and probably for next year we're already having pandemic themes creep mm. in like I did boy that's one I forgot about that I was going to mention that uh you know okay. it's definitely probably going to play a part in some of this yeah some of our fiction yeah I haven't read any pandemic books yet okay like explicitly pandemic. Yeah, I read two that it was definitely a theme hmm. and both came out at the end of this year. Okay. So. so one of the other things that I realized, so for our best of, as Claire mentioned, we have limited ourselves to only books that were published in 2021. Um, and I found that to be really difficult for me. I tend not to read super current stuff like I kind of wait until the holds lists have died down mm -hmm. and you know things like that so a lot of my there were a few books that I would have picked as like this book was like the best book I read this year but it was an older book yeah that same thing happened to me mm -hmm. so yeah but you also read a lot of of arcs like advanced reader copies right too. and so I can't talk about those yet because <laughs> they're technically not published yet so, oh, okay yeah. yeah so nobody else would necessarily be right. able to put a hold on it and read yeah, it exactly so. Hmm. so hopefully next year I'll remember them <laughs> <laughs> well that's what um like that's the kind of thing I use goodreads for right oh so. me too I definitely uh I noticed today my to be read list is growing again mm -hmm. and becoming unwieldy and may have to be pruned. Uh oh. Yeah. So, uh oh. Dear. All right. Sometimes they just don't make the cut. No. <laughs> 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 Sometimes 
sometimes I look at it and go, why did I, what was, what did I read that prompted me to put this on? Yeah. Here? Yeah. Well, and sometimes like if you sort your list the other way, I'm like, that book has been in my TBR for 10 years yeah. and I've never picked it up. Am I ever really going to read this book? Right. So we should have that in a challenge one day. We should. Yeah. Um, that's actually in the Book Riot Read Harder okay. challenge this year is read the book that's been on your TBR the longest. Okay. All right. Which I, I liked may, that one. Yeah. I may have to do that one. Yeah. So. All right. Well, shall we uh, now dive into the actual yes. book talking? Let's dive in. All right. Why don't you start, Claire? Okay. The first one I'm going to talk about is actually a memoir nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Um, it was Beautiful Country by Kian Julie Wang. Wang. Yes. Um, and this one was about an undocumented Chinese girl that was brought into the country when she was seven. And it really just was eye-opening to me that what kind of life these people led, how fearful it is when you're trying to work, but yet work under the table and just the circumstances that bring people here and the fact that we have people that were professors in other countries that are now working in mm -hmm. sweatshops in New York City. Um, and the, the title itself, Beautiful Country, uh, it's, it's Chinese, Mai Gu, which translates into Beautiful Country. Um, and just how long it even took her to see that, you know, she said going to see the Rockettes perform was like, oh, yes, there really is a beautiful country here, you know. Mm. Um, so, yeah, this this one really made an impact on me. And I would really love it if she wrote more about her story. Nice. So, Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Um, so then I will go with my nonfiction pick. OK. Um, I always try to pick at least one nonfiction. And that is one that I've talked about before, but it is The Sum of Us by Heather McGee, subtitle What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. And I feel like I talked about this actually not too long ago, um, but it was a really interesting book that looks at um, kind of systems and economics and social policy and how all of those things um, are both affected by and play into racism and racial disparities. Um, but the thing that I really liked about this book, in addition to um, having a very sort of conversational, very readable mm -hmm. format, like this book could very easily have been like, like right. dry, oh, like yeah, the yeah. Sahara. Yeah. Um, and it's not, it's very readable and relatable. But the, the other thing that I really appreciated about it is that it's a book that points out um, certainly things that we as a country and society are not doing well, and in fact, in some cases are doing very poorly, um, but also provides um, hopeful examples. Okay. So places where um, circumstances have changed and how and why okay. and how that ends up working better and providing a benefit for everyone involved. So points out flaws, but also points out solutions and things that are going well. So that's that's very important. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's not just like a relentless down. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Don't need a relentless down. No, I mean, if you're in the mood for them, sure. Yeah. But, oh, but, yeah, that's, this one ended on a more positive note as well. Good. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, so my second one was Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McGonaghy. And I think this is the second year in a row that um, one of her books has placed on my top list. The other one was Migrations. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons why I like this writer so much is she focuses on some aspect of the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, with her first one, it was more global warming. And Once There Were Wolves, it is about a scientist named Inti Flynn. And she is trying, she's part of a team that is reintroducing wolves to the Scottish Highlands. Um, and of course, there is opposition. Uh, there's a farmer who shoots a wolf because he claims it was going to encroach on his sheep. And then you have someone disappear. We also have family secrets. And everyone knows I love a good family secret. <laughs> so, um, so it was a little bit of like family drama, mystery, mm -hmm. 
natural world, which I always enjoy reading about. So, um, and a little bit of romance thrown in there a little bit. Um, she was kind of a tough cookie to crack, but um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McGonaghy. Yeah, so. that one has been on my radar since, I think we talked about it in our um, 2021 preview yes, in it, January. Yeah, might've been on my list. And I still haven't read it, but it sounds so good. And yeah. I, I just need to. Yeah, I really like copy. the way she writes. So yeah. Yeah. Nice. All right. Um, let's do my other sort of genre pick, which is everyone knows I like fantasy and science fiction. So I've got to get a little bit of it in it here. Um, and this year, I think my favorite fantasy or science fiction was Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, um, which I saw the cover before I even knew anything about the book. And I was like, well, this is a book that I have to check out and read immediately because this cover is stunning. Yeah. Um, just stunning. So this is the one that is set um, in sort of a fictional Colombian. Or, yeah, it's yeah. it's based on pre-Columbian mythology. So we're not like explicitly in South America, Central America, but it is like a fantasy world based on pre-Columbian society and mythologies. Um, so we have um, like a religious cult with, um, well, a religious cult, we have sort of um, a political religious establishment with like intrigue and infighting. Um, there's like three main sort of uh, point of view characters that you follow through the book. And it's easily the most unusual and inventive fantasy that I read all year. Um, I read a lot of fantasy this year mm -hmm. and I read a lot of fantasy by women and women of color this year. And isn't she a native author? She is. Yeah. That, yeah. We were talking about trends. That was another thing. Mm -hmm. I noticed a lot of books published by native authors that were very yeah. good this year. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so that was, you know, a trend in my own reading. And I've got to tell you that almost every one of these books was, if not like a fantastic book, like had something really interesting to offer mm -hmm. um, and something different. Right. I love different. Yeah. Um, so most unusual and inventive fantasy that I read this year based on pre-Columbian mythology. And it's the first in a planned trilogy. It leaves you on a heck of a cliffhanger, not gonna lie. Um, but the next installment is titled Fevered Star and it is set to be released in April of 2022. Okay. So I will be um, checking that one out immediately. Yeah, I may have to put that one on my list. It just sounds interesting to me. Yeah, different. Yeah. Different, different. I like different. Absolutely. All right. So next one. Oh, speaking of different, <laughs> um, this one was different for me. Uh, Razor Blade Tears by S.A. Crosby. He had another one that I have been wanting to read. His first book is called Blacktop Wasteland, if anyone hmm. has read that. But he is an author of color. Um, very different premise for me. It is kind of gritty, a lot of violence, but um, it's a mix of, once again, like family drama, but you have a, a, a black father and a white father whose sons were married, mm -hmm. um, had a, a young daughter that they adopted and they were murdered. So uh, the one thing they have in common is that neither one of them can say they really embrace this relationship. They're both kind of ashamed on how they handled it. The fathers. Uh, the fathers. Yes. Um, just because of old stereotypes mm -hmm. and everything else. Um, Buddy Lee, which is the young white man's father, he is an ex-con. So he not only had, you know, his preconceptions of his masculinity, but also the fact that he married a black man. Um, so anyway, what happens is the police don't do much to solve this case. Mm. The fathers really begin to wonder if they're interested in solving it at all. Um, it's set in the South. There's a lot of bigotry. So they decide they're going to start investigating on their own. And 
and mete out some justice. So the ending is kind of preposterous in a Bruce <laughs> Willis diehard sort of way. Yes. But I have to say, I was very intrigued by this mm. book. I I enjoyed the growth of the characters, even though they they both kind of came across a little stereotypical at first. The you know, learning about the families, the drama, seeing where these men started to come to the realization of what happened in their relationships with their sons, um, a lot of regrets. So yeah, it was, um, I really have to say I enjoyed it. And I definitely want to go back and read his first book. And I certainly hope he keeps writing. Okay. I believe he lived, lived somewhere in Virginia now, but um, just, you know, something different and yeah. a different perspective. And mm -hmm. I really liked it a lot. Do you think that one would be a good book discussion? Yeah, I do. Okay. I definitely do. Mm. Don't you steal it from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we both put yeah. things up for vote yes. for our group. So. That's true. And I can always pop in if you do it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. for sure. All right. Um, then that means I'm going to go with another one that I talked about fairly recently, which is Transcendent Kingdom by Yaj Yassi. Uh, so this one is a grief and trauma book. Um, it is the story of Gifty, who is a young uh, Ghanaian immigrant. She came to the U.S. with her family when she was very, very small. Uh, her mother, father, and her older brother, uh, Nana. And so we have two timelines. We have Gifty as a young adult person out in the world. She's a uh, postdoctorate or a doctoral candidate at Stanford studying um, neuroscience and specifically addictive behavior and bio, like neurochemistry. And we have Gifty's childhood growing up in Alabama where her family settled when they came over from Ghana. So Gifty has had some real trauma in her life. Her father leaves their family and moves back to Ghana. And her brother becomes addicted to opiates after an injury and ultimately dies by overdose. Um, so some real <laughs> issues there, and you can see how that informs her choices later in life. She's studying addictive behavior. So clearly she's like still working through a lot of that trauma. And her mother was also completely traumatized by everything that happened. So the book is really about Gifty sort of working through and processing that trauma and working on kind of healing her relationship with her mother. And it's about also like how to move forward after you have trauma in your life or grief in your life and how to kind of reconcile all of the different parts of yourself and your life into one whole person. Um, it was just beautifully written. Um, I, I loved it. I yeah. thought it was great. And, and that was a read with Jenna. I noticed mm -hmm. that was another trend of mine. I think my first one was a yeah. read with Jenna. I, I'm okay. switching with Jenna lately. I don't hmm. know why. Yeah. I don't really pay attention Oh, to that, but maybe I should start to. Yes, I'm one of those weirdos that's sitting there at the first of the month looking <laughs> at my Instagram, no, waiting no, no. to see what recent Jenna pick. I mean, yeah, yeah. So. It, it's interesting because clearly they're like getting information from places, like, right. you know, yeah. like they've got their finger on the pulse. They there. do. Oh. And they obviously they they must talk to each other because they don't pick the same book either. Oh, I'm sure they have people that make sure that that, like, that doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How embarrassing. Yes. What if Reese and Jenna and Oprah all, all pick to the, the same, same book? book. <laughs> oh, <my. laughs> OK, I've lost my place. Sorry. It's, it's once I will, once I go. Yep. OK, slow fire burning. All right. Another. Mm. Another, like I said, I was really into the mysteries this year, thrillers. I, I really liked The Girl on the Train, so I really mm -hmm. wanted to pick up A Slow Fire Burning. And I have to say, I really liked this one. Um, good for you, Paula Hawkins, because it kind of builds, you have this man on a houseboat who was murdered. Um, and there's family in the area. There's a busybody neighbor that lives in the next houseboat. Um, he just had a one night stand with someone that you're not really quite sure how stable she is or if she's got some mental issues. 
So you have this cast of characters and it slowly just kind of weaves their stories in and out. And you find out, of course, what happens at the end. But um, yeah, a good, just a good story, mm-hmm. I thought. It really kept me engrossed and I couldn't stop reading it once I started. Absolutely. Yeah. So I listened to that one on audio not too long ago, um, which is why you scooped me. And <laughs> I haven't gotten a chance to talk about it, which is fine. Yeah. But um, in a plug for the audiobook, it is narrated by... Oh God, now I can see her face and I cannot come up with her name. Um, Help us from, <laughs> from the movie of Gone Girl, Rosamund Pike. Oh, okay. Rosamund Pike, who is amazing. She's fantastic, fantastic actress. And she is a really great narrator. Okay. Um, so plug for that. And then also that is one of the books that falls into my kind of category of like who gets to tell what stories and questions of authorship and kind of like meta yeah. authorial okay questions cool yeah all right so oh I know it's my turn yes <laughs> so I will do my kind of um so this one so it's girl a by Abigail Dean another one I talked about much earlier in the year um and this one is a little bit thriller and a little bit like grief and trauma. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of loosely based or inspired by the Turpin case, which if you don't recall by their name is the house of horrors from California. So in like 2016 or 2017, um, uh, like 16 year old girl climbed out of a window in her house in suburban California and ran to the road and found someone with a phone and called the police because her entire family of like 12 siblings was being essentially held prisoner in their house by their parents. Um, (laughs) So- Wow, that's a lot of trauma. A lot of trauma. So this is kind of a similar setup. So girl A is Lex Gracie. Um, Girl A is the pseudonym that the police and the courts used for her in all of the paperwork surrounding the case um, because she escaped from her house where her parents were holding herself and her siblings um, captive in just unbelievable conditions. Um, So what kicks off the book is Lex's mother has died in prison. She died. And now... Um, and her father was already deceased. So now it's up to Lex to kind of figure out what to do with the house Ooh. because the parents have still maintained ownership of the house. And when her mother dies, it passes on. So they have to kind of figure out what to do with their own house of horrors. So it's again, kind of two timelines, present day, and then flashbacks to um, how the situation at home kind of grew and built to what it was. Um, there's a lot of processing of grief and trauma. Um, and it was fascinating, but not lurid, Okay, That's which good. I think you could easily slide into that with right. this kind of story. Um, it's not tabloidy. It's not the national Enquirer. Um, it's very matter of fact about a lot of the stuff that happened in the house, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, it was unlike anything else I read this year. Okay. So it's not thriller like in the way that like slow fire burning is, or I don't know. Now I'm not coming up with any other <laughs> thriller title. <laughs> um, but it is definitely page turning. Like you want to find out what happened right. to Lex, how things got the way they got. Yeah. And how she's going to deal with it okay. moving forward. Yeah, I'm going to so. have to add that one to my list too. It was really good. Yeah. yeah. Let's keep doing this one. I one. know. All right. So my next one is mm-hmm. When the Stars Go Dark by Paula McLean. Most of you will probably recognize her as writing The Paris Wife. And she wrote another one about another one of Hemingway's wife. <laughs> this one was a, a big deviation for her in that it, was 
more about based on, I think, her own experience, which was a girl that had been sexually abused and then a girl goes missing. So you have a character of a detective that came from San Francisco that has like a personal trauma and she goes back to her hometown of Mendocino. Mm -hmm. And once she gets there, she finds out another girl, there's a young girl that's gone missing. And that's what happened when she left was that there was someone that had gone missing that she was close to. One of her friends, of course, has stayed there and has become sheriff. So they're trying to figure this out. Mm -hmm. But meanwhile, there's kind of going back and forth to her own personal trauma. So I thought it was very good. I think my book club, we voted to do this uh, for the next okay. year. Um, hmm. but, I might have to join you for that one. Yeah, but so you have this person, um, Anna Hart is the detective who specializes in missing persons work. So she starts working on this case mm -hmm. when she's supposed to be on leave. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it was it was very good. There might be some triggers for people, um, but on the all in all, I thought it was very good, very different, mm -hmm. and I would highly recommend it. Um, nice. I think it'll make a great book club discussion. Okay. So yeah. Cool. Um, well, my last book is one that I have not yet talked about on a book break. It is Matrix by Lauren Groff. And this is one of those ones where I must have read about it somewhere and put a hold on it and then forgot completely about it because it just showed up on hold for me. And I was like, what is this book? Yeah. I don't, what is this book? And I had no recollection whatsoever what it was about when I started reading it. Um, so surprise, this is historical fiction. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think I know what this one is. Yeah, yeah. Um, very historical fiction. So set in like the 12th, 13th century in England. Um, our main character is Marie, uh, based on Marie de France. Um, so from my little bit of research, it sounds, so there's a real historical figure called Marie de France, who um, was briefly part of Eleanor of Aquitaine's court mm -hmm. and then got sent over to England. So that is all true. And then it sounds like, so there's also a historical figure called Marie of Shaftesbury, um, the Shaftesbury Abbey. And there's not really, it looks like historical consensus of whether those are the same person okay. or two different people, but here they are the same. So, Marie is the illegitimate daughter of, oh God, no, I don't remember, one of the Plantagenets, right? Um, and her mother and her aunts are all these like kind of Amazon warrior women in medieval France. Um, they went on a crusade altogether. Marie went with them when she was like six. She went on crusade. Um, with Amazon women, with like Amazon women and Marie herself is described as being just like ridiculously tall for a girl and kind of ungainly and yeah. unwomanly. Um, so when she is 16, um, her mother has died. She has been running her mother's estate secretly for like three years because she's an illegitimate, she's illegitimate and a daughter. Oh. So she knows as soon as people find out that she's the one running the estate. Yeah, her gig is up. Exactly, yeah. which is exactly what happens. Yeah. So she gets shipped off to England from France um, to become the prioress at an abbey. So she has to take holy orders and she's stuck in this abbey. She's not, when she goes, particularly religious, um, does not have a vocation, um, but she gets to this abbey and like, the nuns are basically on the brink of starvation. They have no money. Like it's kind of a miserable place to be. And what Marie is able to do is she is able to just kind of take the Abbey in hand and change the running of it and kind of make something of it. And she turns this failing Abbey into one of the richest abbeys in hmm. England. Um, over the course of her lifetime. Um, and the book does cover really from the time she is 16 to the time she passes away at like 60 or 70. Um, so it covers a big long time. It's a little book. So there, there are jumps there. Um, 
but it's fascinating. And one of the descriptions, I think, from the publisher um, of the book said that it was exploring the raw power of female creativity in a corrupted world. And I think that's a really apt description because what Maria is able to do is find a community um, with the women in the Abbey and find a way to like lead them and bring them together to make something new and different out of the lot that she was given. So I went into it with zero expectations um, and unexpectedly loved it. Huh. Okay. So, yeah. I've seen it on a couple lists mm-hmm. and I thought the description was so odd. I'm like, oh, mm-hmm. I don't know. And Matrix, which seems very confusing because I was like, oh, this is going to be some sort of like sci-fi, sci-fi, futuristic, yeah. whatever. Um, so Matrix is a very, very old fashioned term for like a female head of Abbey or head of household. So um, like Mater matrix so the same way you have like um aviator and aviatrix right yeah. so this is like the the female okay title cool. so it means like strong powerful woman oh. essentially so, nice yeah all right should we throw in one or two yes yes honorable mentions honorable mentions <laughs> Since we're on the subject of Abby's, my Mm -hmm. honorable mention was the Beatrice Prophecy, which I think I talked about recently in our middle grade, but it was um, really fascinating. One of the best historical books I read, and probably because it is a different time period, Mm -hmm. a little over World War II, people. Um, (laughs) But yeah, this is uh, about a prophet uh, who lives in a, oh gosh, what do you call it? Monastery? Monastery, yes. Brother Edict. And um, finding this young girl who comes is, you know, sick and what happens to her. Mm -hmm. So very good. Nice. So I'm going to do a quick twofer. So who is Maud Dixon and the plot? Um, So this one I talked about, uh, who is Maud Dixon? Uh, The plot I have not talked about. Oh, I'm reading that right now. I know you are. And I can't wait for you to finish so that we can discuss. Um, So these are two more in that sort of literary authorship who gets to tell what stories right. uh, trend. Uh, who is Maud Dixon is a thriller, um, very much like kind of Hitchcockian mm-hmm. or uh, Patricia Highsmith. So if you liked, you know, like the talented Mr. Ripley, you will like this book. It was really good. Um, and the plot, I... I don't even know how to talk about this book without giving anything away. Right. Yeah. Um, so I'm not going to, but you should read it and then come find me and we can talk about it because you will want to talk about it with somebody. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost halfway done. So it's one of those things that once you start reading, you get sucked into. Absolutely. Yeah. It took maybe like the first 50 or hundred pages. I was like, okay, like, all right, but where are we going with this? And yeah. then I was like, oh, that's where we're this going. This is where we're going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, another one with the, the trauma real quickly. I Did I talk about this mm-hmm. one? I think I did. Yeah. No hiding in Boise. Just very unusual. And of course, with the shootings that are occurring nowadays, very interesting to find the perspectives mm-hmm. of the victims. So yeah, another one if good if you're in the mood. Mm-hmm. And then my last honorable mention is Broken in the Best Possible Way by Jenny Lawson. Um, So essays, both funny and heartbreaking um, about just life and also mental illness and chronic illness and crazy cats and crazy (laughs) family. (laughs) So happy and sad, um, but Jenny Lawson has such an interesting and unique voice Mm -hmm. um i i pick up now all of her books okay so all righty 2021 yeah 2021 is in the books so yeah and for a second year in a row we managed not to pick any of the same books in our top five yeah amazing which is kind of amazing it is because we do kind of cross over a bit yeah 
So we would love to hear from you all. Um, if you've read any of the books that we talked about today, what your thoughts were. Again, I was not kidding about anyone who reads the plot. Please come find me. Um, but tell us what else you read in 2021, um, what you thought were your best books, um, what your reading year was like. We want to know it all. Yeah. So come talk to us about it um, in the comments here on Facebook. Yes. We can't wait to hear from you. Yes. So have a happy holiday. Very happy holiday. Keep reading. Yes. And we will be back in January with our 2022 preview. That's right. So get ready. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Happy holidays, everyone. And we'll see you next year. Bye-bye.